Now let the continuation of Cinema Royale begin. <laughs> Anyways, let's move on. I think there is something that I want to go into, but there's a lot of moments in which I don't really remember Bob Hoskins doing, but I guess, I guess, I hope you don't mind, but I'll skip ahead directly to 2005. Uh, but just one thing, uh, hold on a second, I just need to, uh, you don't want to revisit Michael with John Travolta? <laughs> like, oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I had to do that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Apparently he was in Son of the Mask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this was a very bad time for Hopkins' career. Yeah, it really was. Wow. Wow, a bad year in particular. Yeah, this was, he had a very bad streak, especially with Son of the Mask. Holy crap. The fact that um, they try so hard to capture the cartoony nature, like the cartoony Tex Avery nature from the original, they cannot do it. Plus the fact that it ends, they, there are so many scenes that end up being so godforsaken disturbing mm-hmm. that it is like charming and cartoony and fun. It's like, no, like seriously. But it's a family it's, dick, George. <laughs> shut up. Yeah, as, as uh, Ralph Bakshi would put it, you know, it's a family picture. There was this very, very nice scene with heads getting torn off and stuff in this little nice family picture. This is a family picture, you know? There's a scene where you see the dog and, like, he's getting pulled back and you see his eyeballs coming out. This is a family picture. <laughs> you ever seen where, uh, what's his name there from Scream is, like, gonna feed this baby electro sack instead of the bottle? You know, it's, uh, it's in a filmy picture. It's yeah, not like yeah. wizards, we have all these kids running around yeah. and stuff. Yeah, you know, this is a filmy picture. <laughs> you guys got no referencing here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ralph. You guys uh, have um, what? You can tell by the rest of list, you know. So, yeah. Okay. So, in some of the maps, he plays Odin. Father of Loki. Loki. But Nate the Clown. <laughs> Nate the Clown. This <laughs> dude. The joke oh. won't die. <laughs> oh God. No, but yeah, I, I think I just pretty much summed up yeah, the problem you did. before it tries. Mm-hmm. Like holy crap. Yeah. Well. Never yeah, like, mm-hmm. like th- this is just a lesson for Hollywood. Even if you want to be, no matter how hard you try, if you want to be cartoony, especially in your animated films, don't. And if you want to do, just be subtle about it, or else you're going to look really, really, really stupid. You know, I'm starting to think if they were going to go cartoony, it would be interesting if they had Bob Hoskins as Yosemite Sam. <laughs> Technically, yeah. Technically, they did. All right. Where's that burning rabbit I've been chasing the last five years? Where's that block? Rack and frack and bomb. Where's that rack and frack and low case? Eddie, you see this change. You tied your hair to the giant mustache. Rack and frack and bomb. Don't you think it's okay? He's using that, uh, he's using that gun that, uh, that Yosemite Sam gave him at the corral. Yes, 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 yes. yes. It comes full yes. circle, yes. Which way did he go? <laughs> I don't know, he went that way. Remember him to the Indian bullet? <laughs> oh, he just flew off into the night. No. Who's the best one? I wanna I wanna explain part of uh part of exactly what's what's wrong with the the uh, son of the mask. Um 
for starters, uh, look no at... James Carey? Huh? No Jim Carrey. Oh, it goes, it goes even further than that. that. Let's, let's take a look at The Mask to begin with. Based on a comic book. Based on a comic series. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, my gosh. Um, I'm starting to get flashbacks from uh, mm-hmm. one of you guys showing the original comic. And mm-hmm. We uh, talked about it in the previous episode. Well, here's a here's an here's an image to uh, to perfectly sum up and remember uh, everything. Yep, yep. Deja vu all over again. Nope. The um the the concept of the of the story of the mask, what shall I say, what works with it is um is you have an individual uh who has a goal and they they are given a key uh, to achieve that goal in the form of the mask. That was uh, that was the uh, the premise of the comic, and uh, it as dark and underground and disturbing as it was, it was it had a successful run. It was it was fairly popular. Uh, it wasn't mainstream though. Uh, the film is successful because it maintains that element even though it takes a much more family friendly approach it uh it's not trying to be like the comic where it was uh freaking disturbing um instead of instead they went with the more comical light-hearted antics of Jim Carrey who plays a character who still who has a goal uh, who is given the opportunity to attain that goal via the mask. Here's where Son of the Mask gets that wrong. Son of the Mask is about a dog and a baby fighting. <laughs> Basically, yeah. It is a it is a chaser cartoon. No, you're wrong, Morgan. Not really. <laughs> oh, <God>. uh, <laughs> Not really. Actually, I'd take this over what James showed me any day. Taxidermy Balto, Headless Jim, Carry and Mask. Uh. <laughs> now I'm just cool. thinking Jim Now I'm just thinking all Jim Carrey has in Return to Oz. That would be great. It's <laughs> almighty, so you know. <laughs> We're just thinking all devil from High Strong. Oh my God! Hey, he's the uh, yeah, you are the Gail, Gail. Since you see all the collections, Gail, Gail, Gail. Oh, Dorothy, hey. it's your cable guy. All oh, right, Dorothy. And then the other one, it's just his butt going. <laughs> oh my God! I like to ask you a few questions, Dorothy. <laughs> Are you in Kansas? You want to go home, Dorothy? I'll show you home. Oh, no, no, no. I no, got no, a feeling no, you're no, not in no. Kansas anymore. No, 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 no. No, no, no. What? What? Nope, 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 nope. What am I cooking? Nope, nope, nope. Are they made from real nope. girls, Scouts? Nope. <laughs> Yeah, no. Nope. Let's um, let's move. How did how did it how did it go for Bob Hoskins to a creepapalooza? Exactly. Yeah, seriously. Um, we all know nope. the sun mask is really bad. Nope. nope. This episode took the shark at the spam can. <laughs> yep, it sure did. Because the the reason why we keep jumping all over the place is because Bob's career spanned a wide variety of things. Well, that, uh, plus the fact that this is the point of Bob Hopkins' career where he did jump to the sh- jump to the shark, and plus the fact that we don't really like to think about his movies during that period, like Son of the Mask. Mm-hmm. Well, still, he did do Badger in the BBC adaptation of The Willows. Yeah, but that's a, that's the movie. 
Oh, no, wait, no. That is... Oh, that, was like, that is a that movie. Was, yeah, that was oh. after the down point. That does count. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, um... The same... Yeah, but like like I was saying, uh, Bob's not the problem in Son of the Mask. Yeah, exactly. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're not saying it's, that. It's, it's just the... It's just the treatment. The entire universe, every which way that they that they could go wrong with the story that didn't work. It it was a, like I said, it was a chaser cartoon, not a mask movie. Mm-hmm. The way I see it, the the way they tag Bob Hoskins on, it was another case with um with a, with how they got Mickey Rooney to do a um, sequel to the Silent Night Deadly Night. They just tagged him on for marquee value for the older people. Mm-hmm. That's how I see it. Oh, yeah, that mm-hmm. makes sense. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. And, yeah, it would make, and it also makes sense that um, it, 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 all, it, it also makes sense considering that this is one of the more cartoony live action films and that they got Eddie Valiant to be in it, you know? Mm. Well, here's, here's something else. Uh, if you take the... Let, let's, let's see where I think the real treatment of this, the real problem with this movie lies. Um, let's take a look at the director, Lawrence Guterman. Prior to, uh, prior to directing this movie, he had a big hit. Can you guess what that was? Cats and Dogs. Cats and Dogs. Oh, uh, yes, which, I love Cats and Dogs. Which, he was a writer for Tales from the Crypt at one point. Mm-hmm. So, I, pers- personally, I... I'm, I'm not really favorable towards cats and dogs, but it was a... I can understand. It was a big hit. Well, like, it's not necessarily a great film, but there was just one... It was the villain of the film that really, really makes it for me. Oh, yeah. Like, the movie was, was worth it alone for Mr. Tinkle's award. Oh, wait, Mr... What Mr. Was Bigglesworth. Mr. Tinkle? Richard Tinkle's. Mr. Bigglesworth. No, it's not Mr. Bigglesworth. It's not Mr. Bigglesworth. Mr. Tinkle. Yeah, hold on. Where is it? Uh, Mr. Kaji. Oh, Mr. Tinkles. Mr. Tinkles. Mr. Tinkles. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Tinkles and the maid. And the owner. <sighs> Mr. Tinkles. <laughs> you made it. I go boom. <laughs> now, I want you to stay here. Why? Because I hate you. You know, he did have a scene where he was going to go to a veterinarian and he escapes in a James Bond kind of way with a creepy nurse robot, but that got mm-hmm. cut out because... Uh, but no, 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 as much as the audience applauded and liked it, the director thought there should have been a funny scene at the end instead of doing a sequel book. Uh, yeah. Strictly speaking, this is a guy who was successful doing this type of a movie. He had no business doing a mask movie. Yeah, yeah that's true. true. And speaking of which, here's what he's doing now. The Bremen Town Musicians. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a pre-production, and so far they got attached to it. Um, Alan Cumming, Nev Campbell, and Jeffrey Wright. Oh, it's a it's a reunion with the Son of the Mask. Mm-hmm. And apparently. Alan and apparently Nev Campbell is doing a character called Princess Lily. And it's an anime... Oh, God, it's animation. Yes, it is animation. Is it yes. The I by who? Luxor Entertainment. That sounds familiar. Is it Luxor or Luxor? I don't know. And in, in any I... case, it it might work. Anyways. I don't know. Anyways. Yeah. What else do we have to talk about? Well, the same year that, um, the same year that Hoskins was in, uh, Son of the Mask, here was the other low point. Um, Unleashed. Didn't see it. Did not see it. Did yeah. not see it. I was the only one, so, here's, uh, Here's what you need to know about Unleashed. It was oh 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 is that the one with the the the, the kid the kid that knows martial arts and he's being treated like a dog and he has a collar around his neck and they control him by that? 
Yeah. Yeah, okay, 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 I know what you're talking about. I didn't see it, though. Jet Li is, uh... Oh, right. He's, he's a he's dog a, boy. He's a, he's a, well, dog man. Uh, um, he was straight... He's part wolf, part dog... Oh, no, I know that's the wrong one. Part wolf, part human, and... also. <laughs> It's a reunion! It's Baldo too, real life! <laughs> <laughs> yes, and Boris is morphed into a, in, into a, a, a coffee man who's, uh, who's very sadistic. But, um. Danny but, the dog, Morgan Freeman is in it, and they have Jet Li's Danny the dog, but still, go on. Mm hmm. Yeah, the. Uh, I, this. This film, it, it was fairly well received. I personally did not, did not find it to be too hot, although I, I do like the director's, no, scratch that, I do not like the director, except maybe The Incredible by, Hulk. Well, it was written by Luke the Song, so there Luke you go. The Song, of course. Oh, yeah. So that might explain quite a lot. Um, the story is... This is about a man who has been raised to believe very much that he is an animal. He's he's trained he's been trained to fight by Bob Hoskins. Hey, you don't want to deal with a loan shark. And that's that, that's sort of our our first problem right there. But um, in any case, uh, the the story though is uh, a is we is he he's trained to fight in in underground uh fights and whatnot and make uh Hoskins character a buttload of money in the process and all he has to do is take the collar off of Lee and suddenly he jumps around and starts kicking butt like a wild animal. It's the crime of the century. Mm hmm. Exactly. And so at one point Hoskins is hospitalized, he's shot, and uh, uh, Lee is left to be uh, presumably dead, at which point he, he, um, he ends up meeting Morgan Freeman on the street, uh, who, start, who starts to slowly introduce him to the world outside of what he knows, which is just uh, a cell uh, underneath the underneath the floorboards, and he starts to experience the world for the first time in his life. He starts learning how to talk, and um, uh, he become he becomes uh, something else, a human being as opposed to a dog. I did not I did not find this movie very viable though because. Uh, the choice of casting. Uh, for starters, ac actually, it wasn't just that. Um, also, the fight choreography, which is highly praised uh, in this film. I thought Lee did better in other films. Um, but the casting... The casting of Bob Hoskins as a guy who's essentially taught Jet Li Kung Fu... I don't buy it. That's what ruins this movie. It it would be like uh, I would I would actually I could actually see um, uh, Morgan Freeman talking uh, teaching him kung fu over <laughs> over Bob Hopkins. The will of Dan the dog is such a tragic and low-brow story of a man who had no owner and no life at all. Raised to be a dog or a wild animal like how Mulder was raised by a pack of wolves. It seems a strange of marsupial connection between the canine and the human one. It's a very strange one to coexist indeed in the animal kingdom. Now, That's all why I have to ring. That's why all penguins I ring. That's why penguins reign supreme, especially when you're in Shawshank, telling shit of stories like this one. That is actually how we made Happy Feet. All the penguins we saw in March of the Penguins all had secret shot collars. 
once we took them off, they start dancing like crazy. And that is how we created Happy Feet. We're free! We're free of the callers! We're free of the callers! We're free! <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Just because you have a, just because you have a very tough cockney accent doesn't mean, doesn't explain everything. I know Kung Fu, man. Listen, I know, I know Kung Fu. I've treated you like an animal your own life. <laughs> That's all you need to know to, to, to know how to do Kung Fu. And this, and this is Jet Li's Kung Fu all throughout the movie, pretty much. Aside from some backflips and some fancy stuff, this is the majority of his fight choreography. Easy. This is an unrated version. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. There's a fun way down. There's an unrated version where he uses his feet like that, like yeah, <laughs> so yeah, it, it's a shame too because we seem to we seem to have skipped over some potentially really good ones like. Uh, to get to this point, like, um, Made in Manhattan, Beyond the Sea, uh, which I was, which I was actually told Bob sings on the soundtrack. Now, I'm, I'm anxious to hear about that. The most, the only, I don't know, the most that I've heard him singing is during the end of Who Framed Roger Rabbit, honestly. I never really picked up his voice at the end. All I heard were the cartoons. Mm hmm. And Hollywood Land. Uh, the year following Unleashed and Son of the Mask. Speaking of 2006, let me talk about another sequel he was in. Oh dear, no. Do we need to? Can we just oh, no. over Robert Zemeckis' Christmas Carol? Yeah, can we go to that? Because he played like two or three roles in that one. And it's more yeah. interesting than a pit bull that's trying to serve a Tim Curry kitten. Yeah, really. Giving like, him. I'm a, trust me, I'm a Garfield fan. James knows. And even mm. I'm like, no. I hated the first Garfield movie. Why would I even give a butt's ass about Garfield 2? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I just wanted to mention it, at least. It will never die, Matt. It will never die. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> there. I, I mentioned it, at least. But before we get into the Christmas Carol... I want to tell you about a 2008 film that I tried to watch for this episode. And, it, and the word means try. The film is called Doomsday. It's a American sci-fi thriller. It's basically set in the future. Scotland's being quarantined because of a deadly virus. Is that, that the one where... Pinocchio. <laughs> uh, is that the one where in one scene they fry a live guy and they eat him up? I, yes, and let me go on and say, uh, <laughs> let me let me go on and say that I try to watch it. I didn't see the movie all the way through. I try to watch it. I fell asleep during the damn thing, <laughs> which is it like terrible. But I seen the opening sequence, and it's these you know because there's there's narration talking about the you know deadly virus, blah blah blah, and then you know they're in Scotland, and you know these civilians are got the disease and there's army men shooting these people down trying not to cross the border and there's like this one scene where the army man shoots a kid in the eye and they're he has to put like a blindfold over his eyes because both of his eyes are fucking gone and i couldn't stay awake to watch the movie it just it didn't thrill me i guess as <laughs> as i would say well it sounded like it turned out so good it, it did it did but, it, but then later on i was like I mean, a kid getting shot in the eyes and somehow living? How could you not beat that? Exactly, because I was with the mom, because it was so endearing, because it was like, <gasps> No, not the kid! No! So I, take it, so I take it you didn't stay away to see the cannibal scene? No. 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 I guess. I guess. I guess. Because I assume it would be. 
I guess I don't like. They literally. They literally drop him into that fire pit quicker than what's his name in Temple of Doom. It's terrible. Yeah. It's, um. Eh. Eh. Like. <laughs> but it has a lot of references in this movie, so. Yeah. Eh. Sounds a little bit Day of the Dead ish to me. It, it, it's kind of. I'm gonna skip that. It's a it's a virus really? movie. It, the virus movies are never that good. It's like really, oh a deadly virus movie. Oh my god, how are we gonna survive this? Where's the cure? <clears throat> bah. The I cure is. I hate those films. The cure is Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is the cure of everything. <laughs> Even though they called it the Jesus disease, Jesus is the cure. <laughs> that could be a movie, the Jesus yeah. disease. <laughs> All right, is that what they call it in the movie, the Jesus disease? No, 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 no. I just made that my crap up. Okay. The person no. you're talking about. It, it had a scientific name in the film, and I couldn't even say it to tell you what it is. But it's just this. They were talking about how going ads from here to Quebec. <laughs> there was. In the narration, in the opening narration, too, they were saying, like, uh, the virus is not like a human being or animal. It kills because it kills. That's what it's made to do. And I'm thinking, like, uh, no kidding. Why would you say that to me? It's not a man-made virus. It's a virus. There's virus around us. There's bacteria all over us. So if it happens, it happens. So what? Mm-hmm. Mm. Anyways, I'm to cheer your memory. <laughs> you can go on about the Christmas Carol the next year in 2009. Morgan, it's okay. yours. Yeah, Morgan, go ahead. Oh, right. Well, anyway, the funny thing about Bob Hoskins is how he can really get in all of his characters when he did Badger in the one of the woes. Oh, right, right, the uh, Christmas Carol. Sorry. Um... Well, we can talk about Wind of the Willows. <laughs> we can, yeah. We can go back to 2006 and talk mm-hmm. about it. Technically, yeah, but... playing up to a... What's his name? Is Mr. Toad there? Yeah, um... Who is Mr. Toad? Matt um, Lucas. Yes, Matt Lucas, thanks. The, Morgan just showed me this uh, a week or so ago. Um, I initially thought that uh, this, this 2006 Wind of the Willows... I initially thought that I was going to get rather bugged out by it because of the concept of doing a story like this as a live as a live action piece. It didn't it didn't work to me, and I I thought one of the first things that I I thought that it was going to be was guys in furry costumes that haven't really aged very well or something like that. Uh. Kind of like the the Irwin Allen Alice in Wonderland, which I watched as a kid, but nowadays I'd sort of find it annoying if I saw. But uh, um, uh, this was this was an even weirder choice when um, when you look at it on the surface. Here they have humans playing animal characters in a live action setting, and yet. They are, they, they, they call themselves Mr. Toad, Badger, um, Rat, Rat, Hole, all that, Weasels, Weasels, except they're all humans. They're all human beings. And without, without much to, uh, to to connect them to the animalistic traits that uh, that makes their character, and somehow it worked, to, sort of, for me. I thought that there was kind of a nice little charm to it, and I kind of thank Morgan for changing my mind. You're welcome. Yeah, the director who did this uh, film also did, uh, let's see, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, and Tank Girl. I didn't know that. Well, I, you know. 
explain so much. Mm. But no, the interesting thing about Hoskins is that here he's really channeling a lot of grumpy energy out of this. It's like his take of Oscar the Grouch, but British. And that's pretty much what the character Badger was sort of like. He's sort of this ancient, um, wise man kind of character, but, you know, like that really, really grumpy grandfather didn't have his coffee in the morning. And knowing the book and the stuff it's going for, it does it pretty, pretty well here, especially Bob giving it his own... Um, they do hint enough that he had really that he had um, a connection to Toad's dead, which explains why he's going after his throat when he's wasting his inherited money on like motor cars and stuff like that. And just the way he gives that, you know, stare when he's angry, he's goddamn angry. He's like, there's a scene where Toad is, you know, getting a new car and it's springtime and Badger's coming out, and he's walking straight towards Matt Lucas, and he has this really Sprunty like staring, he's you know growling a little. It's like you really, really fear from it's like good god, shit is going to hit the fan when he meets up with this guy. Mm-hmm. You do not want to piss off Bob Hopkins. <laughs> and in fact, he's playing off of Matt Lucas's um, loopy energy. It really works to its advantage. It's like trying to deal with the kid on a sugar high. It it really works pretty well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The downside of the film is that the version I saw first was released on PBS of a VHS recording of film where it was on Masterpiece Theater and they had some scenes down for time constraints. The version I saw with James was the British version, and it was nice to see what they cut out, but at the same time, some of the additions were a bit, a bit too much. Not to you know press on too long. This is a three-hour podcast at the time being. But they kept in stuff like um, the scene with Pan, half man, half go, which I always thought was a weird scene even in the book, because it really pushed the boundaries of the mythology of the world. So, like, it's a place that's like humans and animals coexist, and they allow this kind of thing to roam in. Okay, I guess chickens are eaten in Rockadoodle. Um... Another dark thought. Um, <laughs> another... Another is the scene where it's like Christmas time and it dwells on for like a good few minutes. I understand why that was removed in the Masterpiece Theater edition, obviously because, um, believe it or not, they released it around Easter and I guess they wanted to have this Easter springtime kind of thing and yeah, it makes sense. But at the same time, it feels a little weird and off-putting, especially in the scene um, where a bunch of carolers come in and they're like, oh, come on in, we're going to celebrate with Jim and stuff and... Okay, I guess that's not the time. It, 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 it just goes on, it goes on and on and on. I've seen people praise the sequence, and I'm sitting there going, okay, maybe on another viewing it makes sense, but to me at the moment, I mean, okay, the book deals with the four seasons in a round. You go from fall, no, you go from spring to summer to fall to winter, and then spring again, and you just literally go around again. I always thought that was an interesting allegory. Here, it feels weird for some reason, but if you want to see Bob Hoskins as grumpiest, or what could have been a British version of um, Oscar the Grouch, check it out. I'm not stopping it. It's at least worth it just to see Bob, you know, ham up as this grumpy uh, woodland critter. And he has, like, this nice tree house, too. It's great. Okay, this got a little more interesting about the director. Okay. Uh, Morgan, director. Morgan might like this, maybe, depending on what he thinks about the upcoming eighth series of Doctor Who. Uh-huh. She, the director, Rachel uh, Tanalele, she's going to direct two episodes of the upcoming season of Doctor Who. Yeah, can I see how that's going to go? Oh, oh, um. Alright, alright. Okay, so. Next up we have. Moving on to the Christmas. A Christmas Carol? Mm hmm. Go for it. Go for it, guys. Um. I initially. I initially avoided, uh, this film when it. when it came out. I did not see it in theaters. Lucky. Uh, 
because I actually, as as much as I I love the story of a Christmas Carol, I I have to ask myself how many different versions of it do we need, and that's exactly what I was thinking when this came out, and uh, like I. Like I said in my History of Scrooge episode, it's, uh, it, it, it was an adaptation that um, really needed to lighten up a bit. It wasn't bad. I mean, there was, a, there was a lot of effort and a lot of charm put into it. It was, but the other half of it what, that was not charming, plays, it plays out like a horror film. Straight up. As for as for Bob uh, here playing the role of Fezziwig, I actually wig. Posse wig. <laughs> Thank you all and uh, Merry Christmas. Oh, that was short. Oh, I can't listen to all. I was saying. Uh, uh, for one, this is a this is a reunion with uh, Robert Zemeckis. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Uh, as for his portrayal of Fezziwig, uh, the uh, the accent works, the attitude works, um, and the, and then uh, and then the the illusion is is broken ever so slightly when he starts dancing. Yeah. Mm. Uh, this is uh, a Fezziwig is a character who is described as being not just cheerful but also light on his feet. Um, if this adaptation is to be believed, and this is something that I neglected to mention in that episode for time constraints, uh, Bob Hoskins uh, or CGI Bob Hoskins, I should. I should mention, uh, does have a dance number that it that he goes through with, uh, and during that dance number he starts uh, flittering his legs about like a ballerina <laughs> and flying through the air, defying gravity. This is it's like they're it's like they're attempting fate with wicked. <laughs> Mind you, this is uh, this is not supposed to be. Uh, this is a point in the film that's not supposed to be supernatural. This is supposed to be. I mean, the the story to begin with is inherently supernatural. What with the ghosts and the how looking in the past, present, and future. Um, uh, this is somebody's memory of somebody else. Do you really want to remember them flittering about like a jellyfish? <laughs> it was quite unrealistic. Uh, yeah, if you can't find me, Scrooge, look to the western sky. Mm-hmm. Uh, one one moment that that wasn't supposed to be super uh, or over the top was over the top, but uh, that's all I have to say. Mm-hmm. I think I'll, I'll add in my fill before Morgan goes. Um, I have an alternate title for this version. I always like to call it Mr. Scrooge's Wild Ride. Because <laughs> this is essentially, if you take the story of Scrooge and, like, you add in all these bombastic scenes, like, where Mr. Scrooge, where Scrooge goes, like, not, I wouldn't say Scrooge himself goes crazy, but it's like he goes on this epic adventure that looks like it belongs on a three on like a three D theme park ride, and like it goes bombast. It, it really is like bombastic, and it's like it really goes everywhere. However, there is a lot of he goes. However, there are some problems with it. Go on. <laughs> However, there are some problems with it after what you can Because there's a lot of problems. Because there's a lot of problems. 
Number one I'll mention is the animation. Now, this is from Robert Zemeckis' Image Movers Digital. And the huge problem with Image Movers Digital that somehow they don't understand is that they're trying to use the technology to make people look like people. Why do you need to do that, dude? You could just simply film it in live action. You don't need it. Like, they don't really use much for it. Okay, maybe it's useful for the spirits, but not really for, like, for like everyone else. Like, even with Scrooge, like, Lemony, Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events has proved that you can definitely alter Jim Carrey's look by, you know, just adding, yeah, by adding prosthetics. And then there, and I mentioned the CGI Baby 2, which at times, it has that realistic kind of vibe, so it doesn't look all cartoony and stuff. No, 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 they do it way, that's the problem. With motion capture, they did it way too realistic. So oh, it yeah. kind of, it's like a little, it's like some, there are some times when it looks too realistic where it's uncomfortable. Okay. It's not like Tintin where like they, perf- it looks so real, it's unbelievable. It's like, oh my God, that's, wow. But like with this one, it's like, it, it's tr- it's trying so hard to look real, but you know it's fake, and it gives you that unnatural, uh, like this unsettling vibe. Mm. And then another another problem I want to mention is the horror factor when it tries to be scary. When it tries to be scary, it gets freaking horrifying. <laughs> one, one one scene that I remember is that. Is the transition from pre- from present to future, where apparently you see like where apparently like the two kids under um, the the ghost of pre- Christmas present ignorance is unleashed. Yeah, ignorance and want, and suddenly they become splicers from uh, Bioshock. Meanwhile, the scene people freaking. Uh, Freaking Ghost of Christmas Present is just lavish up this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you see him rotting, it's like, sweet freaking Jesus, what the hell is going on? And like, one thing that I'm convinced, Robert Zemeckis must have, must have been inspired by the Haunted Mansion ride. He must have. It, it also explains how Bob Marley brought all of his friends. Like, you would expect at one point when, when you see Scrooge flying around, at one point, like, you'll see the hitchhikers there. And then somebody's like, are you one of Marley's friends? I wish I could save you. Uh-oh. Like, sweet Jesus. I love that story. It free like it honestly scares me. Like it looks freaky and it gives me haunted mansion vibes. I don't like it. And you guys know very well how I feel about that ride. The uh, I can't if if you ever pick this up for classic reviews, I'm really curious to see how you're gonna attempt that review. Oh Jesus. I don't know. Why is it for blank do I, do I even have that? I need to check. Somebody it's not. I, I, I think yes, I, check it. it. It's right after. Uh, it's right after my request for ring bell. I think you know, the minute he did that reaction, the, the minute he did that reaction in the Fergally, I thought he was going to do a food fight for a second there. Oh no 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 no! no. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I know what it is. I know what it is. I mean, I know what it is. <laughs> it's drawn. It has been drawn. <laughs> Pray for me. Uh, okay. There's only one image that I guess sums up your feeling about now both movies. Oh no, I ain't I ain't gonna screw that. Fuck it. No, screw that. No. Nope. Give me Jim Carrey's head on the uh, on, what is on a placard. Oh wait. Oh. oh Jesus Christ 
Kill that, kill that thing with fire! <laughs> I need, I need that, I need that, uh, I need that mask, I need Jim Carrey winking at me to wash that off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, mask decapitated Jim Carrey winking at me. <laughs> at least you make me know that everything shall be okay from that demented Muppet from hell. <laughs> I like Uncle Deadly. <laughs> Okay. No, Uncle Taffy is more beautiful than, than that thing. Seeking of nightmare fuel. Oh, Jesus. I need, now I need to go back to the Christmas Carol. Yeah, speaking of nightmare fuel, let's go back to the Christmas Carol. <laughs> um, um, I had the ability of seeing this in 3D in theaters, and I remember when I was with Megan, we were, it was around near's Eve or so, and we saw that movie, and surprise, surprise, we were the only two in the theater. He started riffing on the movie. <laughs> it was the best time two people were in a movie cracking jokes at the screen where nobody was there. Seriously, there, there's the bit where Christmas present was all like, I see a crutch without an owner, and because of that thick accent, I lean over to Megan. Did he say a crotch without an owner? That is sad. I see a crotch without an owner. <laughs> Sitting by the fire. Uh, but no, going back to Hoskins, easily he was the most recognizable of the bunch because of that accent. It's like when you really familiarize yourself with Hoskins' roles with Eddie Valiant and many of the others, you can definitely tell that, you know, that high-pitched, yeah! Um, voice really, really sticks with you. So the more time you spend hearing someone's voice, you can really distinguish who he is to everybody. It's like um, Mel Blanc. You can tell when he's doing Bugs Bunny and, you know, Fred, uh, Barney Rubble. Sorry, Barney Rubble. I say Barney Rubble, not Fred. Um, and as small as those parts really are, I would have loved to see the quote-unquote Back to the Future gathering, which was rumored. They had Michael J. Fox as Tiny Tim and Christopher Lloyd as um, Marley, which would have been interesting, but they sadly changed that. It was a rumor, but, you know, let me down. Right, isn't, isn't Michael J. Fox still uh, Tiny Tim in this, or...? No, 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 that's Gary Oldman. Wait, Gary Oldman I've... is Tiny Tim. <laughs> I'm trying to process that in my brain. I was like, what? Gary Oldman, Constable Gordon, and a small child. <laughs> that was even his... That was even his voice. A genius. Um, I can't really say much about Bob Hoskins because there really is little of him in there. And the movie is dark, but yet every year I keep on revisiting this and I keep saying to myself, okay... The dark stuff is interesting, and I guess the harrowing message is there, but there's so much darkness that it completely overpowers the loving message, to quote James from the stages of the pictures here. If you want to do it right, do it in the vein of George C. Scott, because you're in the atmosphere, and it's like, yes, it's gloomy, it's dark, but, you know, everybody's happy, cheery. The only one who isn't happy, cheery is Scrooge. And then you have Scrooge with Bill Murray, was in the stress of doing a Christmas Carol adaptation, and yet at the same time he's you know going through this whole trauma, you know he's you know seeing these ghosts and stuff, and because he's such a jerk, he's reliving his past, realizing just how much of a jerk he is, and how his actions are literally causing all these you know small problems with the homeless and stuff, and his girlfriend is seen in the future, uh, but less more. Okay, so Bob. 
Cat Goldfly going bananas with a shotgun. Yeah. <laughs> can't, can't, can't. <laughs> um, Excuse me, I'm gonna explode. <laughs> <laughs> You had a bad day. Let me tell you something. My wife came around home and took my little daughter with her. I can't remember anything of that. To get sure enough, I was blind, stinking, drunk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but seriously though, those adaptations have the better hand because they know how to balance the dark and lightness. This movie, it goes straight for the gloomy stuff. Like, straight to it. Even Bob has the little, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, he was the, uh, that little, um, antique guy there taking all of Scrooge's possessions. Um, I mean, it fits in the tone, but at the same time, it's like, man, he's so familiar that when you hear him as, Fezziwig, and then you hear him as this other guy, it's like, dude, I'm hearing one voice as opposed to two different voices. Mm. That's... And I didn't see Snow White and the Huntsman, so I, didn't, I really don't have anything on that, so... Yeah. He's, he's, he's a dwarf in that yes. one. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say I saw Snow White and the Huntsman. He was Doc. No, he was, a, he was a dwarf named Murr. He was a he blonde... Was he, he, was, he was Dorothy. I mean, dopey. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> and the funny thing is, is that with this film, we kind of mentioned this before in the past, where... Snow White and the Huntsman came out at the same time as Mirror Mirror or another Snow White film, and they were kind of like, you know, competing Snow White films, and the dwarves between two films are completely different. In this film, they're not even um, based on the, um, what you think of when you think of Disney, because they're differently named and different playing in general. Uh, Bob Hoskins plays this blind elder dwarf named Murray, and he has the possession to see it into the future, um, so, I mean, and the thing is, the way they did the dwarves is that, um, their, the actor's face would be, uh, digitally on the small bodies of these small actors, small bodies, mm-hmm. and... Is that uh, how they did it? It wasn't just, uh... No, yeah. They did that in, in post? Yeah, yeah, they did that in Lord of the Rings as well. Yeah, they... Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, and then that, that caused a protest with the little people of America. They're kind of pissed off about that. Because, like, you can't be doing that. you got to have real uh, small actors in there, not these superimposed fakes. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm thinking back now to the role he played as Dwarf, and he did a pretty damn good job as his final role. I mean, he, I thought it was okay. I mean... I mean, uh, I mean, he was a dwarf and he was blind, and that's all I remember. <laughs> I mean, so yeah, I can't, I can't really complain. But I just, I just find the the film to be particularly forgettable. It, easily forgettable, yes, because the film is easily forgettable and weird as can be. I mean, it's, it's the visual style just threw me off. I wasn't ready for the. I like, huh? Well. I, I didn't, it was too dark, I mean, and I couldn't, uh, cause, Thurie, Thurie Throne, God, I can't even say her name, Shuri Throne, Throne, yeah, she played the queen, and there was this one scene where she just comes out of this, like, bath, and she's just covered in this white, uh, gold, 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 <laughs> this white, um, Oh my. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't say I didn't say come. I just meant white goo. <laughs> he deserves it the bath. They're being filled with too much worky sperm these days. Give me the dragon do. You guys are you guys have sick, dirty minds. Get your mind out of the gutters. <laughs> That's not broke me. Better that than what Morgan showed me. Whatever you say. Oh, sorry, Debbie. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's where she went. That's where she went. What's the thing? Speaking of which, 
Seeing which that reminds me. Stay in the bed there. Seeing which that reminds me. In terms of the spam can, I was originally going to use the Inflated Morgan Blow-Up doll, but Debbie's using it tonight. Mm. Oh, Inflated Morgan. <laughs> Why am I just picturing your face on the inflatable pilot on front of the plane? <laughs> it's pretty much what it is. Uh, uh, Debbie's over at my place tonight. She's going to use Peach Mari. <laughs> Oh, look, there appears to be a blow-up tube right here. <laughs> Get so red in the face, I'm laughing. Okay. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Best running joke ever. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never die. No, I'm excited about the running jokes. Gotta love but, that. Um, Overall, Bob House we needs a clown. <laughs> Bob has had many roles, and we didn't even discuss most of his films because we, you know, had so much to do, you know, trying to research what we've seen. Um, he's a great actor, in my opinion. I only wanted to mention... Go ahead. Go ahead. I only wanted to give a brief mention to this because uh, I didn't have time when we were talking about Hook, and uh, I thought that as a, as a follow-up, I might I might give this uh, a mere mention. In 2011, Bob Hoskins was also was reprising the role of Smee. Oh yes. In right, right, right. a TV series called Neverland. Uh, and this I only I only find worthy as to be a mere mention because this this very odd Harry Potter like. Uh, treatment of the uh, the Peter Pan story, um, it it felt like uh, it would as an origin story. It felt a little bit uh, it felt a little bit unnecessarily dark. It uh, it did things that you weren't supposed to, like answer questions about um, Neverland and how how it works, they gave it a, a Michael Crichton-like explanation, like, okay, this is why time comes to a standstill in Neverland, because it's at a point in the universe where uh, if the universe is a circle, then we tie that circle into a bow tie, and Neverland is at the center of the bow. So they convoluted or Jurassic Park it? Ah... Uh, Something like that. They were trying to explain it with science. In oh, oh in, because it was on sci-fi. Maybe, maybe so. the polo. Thank you. Oh, um, okay, that makes sense. But yeah, Bob Hoskins comes. Uh, he's he's uh, back in the role of, of Smee here in a completely unrelated story, uh, a completely unrelated version of Hook. And I think they they might have only got him in there uh, because of his connection with us, because of that that particular film's nostalgic legacy, and that's why I wanted to watch it to see him as me again. He doesn't he doesn't try very well. He doesn't try very hard. It, it's just sort of Bob Hoskins' light as this uh, as that as that's me. And not very interesting, not particularly memorable. He's just there. Sad. Mm-hmm. Ah, uh, shucks. Well, thanks for the mention of that. That's a nice way to end um, this podcast. Um, James, you kind of jinxed it because you said we're not going to have a three-hour discussion about Bob Hoskins, and we have a three-hour discussion about Bob Hoskins. Okay. I don't know, you know. I win. Well, that's because we started with a spam can, so... <laughs> yeah. There was nothing I could do. There were last minute things I had to run around the house for. Understandable, understandable. Mm. Um, so... I think, um, I think Mel Brooks put it up pretty, pretty well. They'll remember you a lot if you're in pictures, and, and in regards to Bob Hoskins, I think he's going to be around for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, we keep remembering him for things like Eddie Vedder 
Valiant, me, and to a certain extent, Mario Mario, you know, when you look at actors today, they don't really give it their 100%. It depends with the pictures they're in, the crew they're with. With Bob, he didn't care. He gave it his all, even if it was just for a role or something, whether he was in Beyond the Sea, a serious movie, or something ridiculous and bad and terrible. So, for that, it's really rare to have an actor like this to really give it their um, mm-hmm. full advantage. Because even if you do see that movie, you can at least credit that one guy, at least it all worth it. And that was Hoskins. That's how we were. Mm-hmm. And that's that is how to play him out. Thank you, Morgan. Um, on the side note, I just bumped into the Urban Dictionary, and there's a definition for bangerang. Oh? Yes. One, Battle Cry of the Lost Boys and Movie Hook. Two, Jamaican slang defined as a hubbub, uproar, disorder, or disturbance. Three, general exclamation meant to signify approval or amazement. <laughs> or that one. Hold it on, Lord. Oh, I feel a batarang going on. A batarang? Bangarang. A bangarang. Hey, let's get oh. the bangarang, eh? From the guy who was talking about Charlie's Theron income. <laughs> oh. Get your mind out of the gutter! Oh my god! Oh, That's hey, a real hey. bangarang. Well, you gotta admit, that's not a pretty bad image. Hey, you think that's bad? I had to fight 14 whip executives while trying to save the monkey man of the 8th dimension. That is more bangering than having a can of spam trying to start off this show. Uh-huh. Well, By the way, I lost. I lost with Blip. Yeah. 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 If I save monkey right. man. Yeah, you got the monkey out of it. Yeah, yeah. Everybody loses with blip eventually. He's in Cleveland trying to get a band off the ground, so good luck to him. Um, and that's all I got. Yep. Uh, I was going to say, Morgan, you pretty much topped the piece of the cake of this episode. I could not even say anything else. You put some words right in my mouth. Wait till next, next week. Yes. Before we end the podcast, let's have an awesome rendition of... Cinema Password with our contestant, Matt Brunet. <laughs> do, do, do. Ooh, this is going to be a thing now. <laughs> yes, because I, I keep saying... Because I like surprises. Yes, he does. Because I oh, keep... oh, you're going to be really surprised by this one. You're going to be really fucking surprised. In a good or bad way? Um, half and half. Yeah, half and half. Um, so, like I said last time, I... Spoiled at the topic to James and Morgan, and uh, Matt just likes to be surprised. So I figure I do the cinema password as a regular thing to keep Matt surprised. <laughs> so what works in this little mini game of ours is that we'll there's the password which the audience will see, and that's <laughs> it, monkey. Thank you. I'll put the password right there. Um, and we'll try to describe the the password in three or less words. And some can be obvious okay. clues and some can be hard clues. Um, so first off, the episode is going to be another um, actor-influenced, you know, we're talking about another actor and his filmography. <laughs> um... Yeah. Oh, no, Morgan, no. No. You don't mean no. <laughs> that's, 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 hear me out, Matt. Hear me out. Tell me what you think. Sony. <laughs> um, uh, it's very, that's a very broad, broad clue. Um, he's a comedian. He's known for his Funny films. Zagat. Uh, more than three words, actually. Zagat. Okay, okay. Um, he's happy when beating up game shows. Hosts. 
No, we already did, Arnold. <laughs> wow, I can't believe you. I can't believe you. Not the running man. So, I can't believe you didn't get that reference. That's actually a big clue, actually, from one of his early films. You better save some room for my kids, because I'm going <laughs> to... Adam Sandler! Yep. Adam, Adam Sandler! Adam Sandler, yes. Okay, so it's not that bad. Okay, so it's not that bad. The price is wrong, bitch. <laughs> Just wait. Just wait to see the movie I am sending to you, Stooges. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. Oh. Um, so, oh. the reason oh. why... Um, oh. No, oh, I got it. Oh, oh, it is on. It is on. <laughs> no. um, what did I do? What did I do? Cloudy D D D. The reason why I bring Adam Sandler up now is because he just released a film called Blended, and I figure we should talk about him because I've seen him some old stuff, and I was like, you know what? We should talk about this bastard and what he's done. I mean, he's Early career was okay, but his he went down a downhill slide. <sighs> Until next time, two weeks from now, this has been Cinema Royale, where it's all about the cinema, the movies. <laughs> I'm your host, Mike Mixtape, and long live cinema. <laughs> I'm Morgan Ledger, looky wookie, I go to hooky on the NES, Super NES, and the Genesis. <laughs> Go, 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 go. I blew that. Let me try that again. Go, 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 go. I'm Adam Ad, and I just want to say throughout this whole time, I have the picture of decapitated Jim Carrey head as the mask <laughs> that's winking at me, telling me that everything is okay. Really? I thought, I thought taxidermy bolt who was going to sever you. No, it's, it's Jim Carrey. His wink, his winking smile tells me that everything is going to be okay, especially yes. after that, abomina- uh, that abomination thing that you showed me. Holy crap! That that is the definition of kill it with fire. Dead dog in a museum is not as creepy as decapitated Jim Carrey mask head. We gotta end this. <laughs> well, at least that one is more reassuring. At least that I can work as a buddy. What is wrong with this fucking world? Uh-huh.